Philip Turner, uh, old friend of many of us and known perhaps to you all, uh, former dean of Yale, uh, of Berkeley at Yale, taught at General Seminary in New York, taught at the Seminary of the Southwest in Austin, Texas, uh, married to an Episcopal priest, uh, just uh, published a volume on Christian ethics with some attention to ethics based out of the book of Ephesians. Uh, so he'll be talking about that today. And our format is that we all uh, uh, have a bit of time after each talk for some give and take. Uh, but we'll also have a session at the end. So if you feel as though you didn't get your question raised, just keep it. Uh, write it down and we'll have a, a session at the end uh, where we'll have more free time for, uh, we won't have to watch the clock quite so closely for the next speaker. So please welcome warmly with me, Professor Philip Turner. Uh, some years ago, uh, in his study of the gospel in the Catholic Church, Arthur Ma Michael Ramsey argued that Greek theology gave its fullest account of the church in the course of expositing Christ's work as Redeemer. And he used a long quote from Irenaeus to back that up, and I'm not going to read the whole quote, but I will read the, uh, the end of the quote which he provides. By becoming head of the church, he, that is to say Christ, may draw all things in due course unto himself. So the idea was that Christ, through the church, completes his work of redemption. By becoming head of the church, he may draw in all, in all things in due course unto himself. In both Irenaeus and Ramsey, we have an example of an understanding of the church that folds ecclesiology into Christology. And Ramsey noted that this linkage between ecclesiology and Christology allowed the Eastern Church to be free of the legalistic and scholastic tendencies apparent in the Western Church. And in this paper, I will argue that if we take Holy Scripture as the proving ground of doctrine, we will link ethics, or as I would prefer to say, moral theology, with ecclesiology and ecclesiology with Christology. In this way, we will avoid the tendency of what the Western Church to convert moral theology into either a spirituality of self-development on the one hand or an ethical demand for social development on the other. And I will make this argument by presenting a reading, a close reading of the epistle to the Ephesians. Okay. Before I begin, I want to make, however, another explanatory remark, a couple, about my theological motivation. The case I'm about to make and have made in this book has grown out of two convictions. The first is that the guild of Christian ethics has to its detriment, in effect, erased the theological roots of Christian ethics and, re and rested their account of Christian living on basic principles like love or justice that frequently, though not always, simply float free from the broader account of Christian believing. The result is an account of Christian living that is rootless. The second is that, my church, that the churches in my country have sought to regain the social position they once enjoyed by continuing to understand their mission to be the moral ordering or transformation of culture. And for various reasons I have, following Robert Wilkin, I said this, become convinced that the chief moral and spiritual challenge of the churches is to become a community in which Christ is taking form. So, um, this conviction led me to another, namely that according to Holy Scripture, the proper focus of Christian moral belief and practice is the common life of the church. And I don't mean to say that the life of the soul or the reform of society are not Christian moral concerns. I simply mean that neither should, be, should provide the organizing focus of the account we may give of Christian living. And I believe that what we have to say about the life of the soul and the common life of society should grow out of what we Christians have to say about our life together. 
I believe that a close reading of Ephesians supports this conclusion, and had I whirled enough in time, I believe I could show that the witness of Holy Scripture as a whole supports this conclusion, but I obviously can't do that. For the moment, I'm content to rest my case upon what Emil Durkheim in the Rules of Sociological Method called a single well-chosen example. However, before I begin this exposition, allow me one more word of introduction. The word, it is a word about method. I have not sought to find an issue in the life of the early church that prompted this letter. Unlike some of the other Pauline letters, this one it has no named occasion. And I've chosen not to imagine an occasion to which no specific reference is made. For example, that the new faith was creating subversive attempts to undermine authority. But to let the letter be its own interpreter. I've tried instead to let each part of the letter shed light on the others and use as historical background only the collective representations of the age that perforce shaped the way people in that time and place thought and behaved. I'll provide an example of what I mean when we come to chapter 5 and 6 that include the infamous household codes of behavior. So what is the goal or basis of Christian living according to Ephesians? In the book I came here to talk about, I argue that the focus of any Christian account of Christian living can be discerned by asking three questions. What is the goal of Christian living? What is the basis or foundation of life in Christ? And what is the character or outward form of life in Christ? By character, I mean the stamp by which you identify something. And if one asks these three questions of any account, one can discern its focus. Is it the life of the soul, the life of the society, or the life of the church? These are the three possibilities history provides us. And so I want to start and ask, how is it presented in Ephesians? And a good place to begin is with a trans transitional therefore that occurs at the beginning of chapter 4. The author of the letter, and I'll just call him Paul, refers back through the therefore to the first three chapters and by using a linking therefore, and he goes on to beg his readers to live a life that is worthy or proportionate to the calling to which they have been called. The question is, what is the calling of the church to which the life of the believer is to be worthy or proportionate? As presented in the first three chapters, the author of Ephesians believes that the church is the place in which God's purpose for the entire creation begins to come to fruition. Ephesians 9, 1 through 11 speaks with remarkable boldness. And it reads, For he has made known to us the secret of his will in accordance with his purpose which he set forth in him, that is to say Christ, for the administering, and I translate asa okonomion, for his administering, the fullness of the ages so as to sum up all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. Paul's thought can be paraphrased in this way. In Christ, God has made known his internal purpose for the creation. That purpose is to unify all things and so bring them under the rule of God. This purpose stands before the foundation of the world, but until the present it has remained a secret. However, at the beginning of the last age, the one issued in by the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, it has been made known to the church. And further, God has revealed not only that the last age is issued in by Christ, but also that it is to be administered by Christ in a way that makes the summing up the unity he purposes visible. According to this letter, the goal of the entire creation is unity in God's Son. Given the extraordinary expanse of this purpose, the assertion found in chapter 1 
verses 22 through 23, is arresting. The arena in which God's plan for the world now unfolds is small rather than large. It is God's assembly, the church, rather than in an empire that Christ's administration of the divine purpose first becomes visible. The primary expression of that administration is depicted in chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, wherein the most basic act of Christ's administration is said to be the reconciliation between Jew and Gentile. These two solidarities, God's people and the peoples of the earth comprise the two classes into which all humankind is divided. Their unity is the first step toward the unification of all things. And by reconciling Jew and Gentile, God establishes his assembly, the church, in a new way. One in which Jew and Gentile together comprise God's people. The calling of this people is to be distinguished from what the epistle calls the rest who are not united with Christ. Now this newfound unity has been brought about by the sacrifice of Christ and not the law. The result of this sacrifice is that Jew and Gentile alike have access to the Spirit, <coughs> in the Spirit, to one God and Father of both. It is also the case that the Gentiles who once lived without access to God's covenant with Israel and its promises are now no longer strangers. They are no longer foreigners or resident aliens among God's people. Rather, they are now fellow citizens with them and members of the same household, namely that of God who is father of both. This household can also be termed a structure a foundation of which is the apostles and prophets. The capstone of the structure is Christ. The Gentiles have, as it were, been built into this structure, and the structure has been joined together in, which, together in a way that it grows in such a way that it so as to become God's holy temple, the place God lives on earth through the Spirit. The same Spirit now dwells in Jew and Gentile alike and serves both as a mark of their ownership by God and as a, genu as a guarantee that they are jointly God's adopted children and also heirs of the one God who is father of both. Unity occupies no, small, no minor place in the providential governance of God and the administration of His Son. The blessing with which the letter begins deploys God's name in its full Trinitarian form. It is God the Father who before the foundation of the world destines both Jewish and Gentile members of the church for adoption as sons and heirs and assigns them their calling within this provident providential purpose. And it is through God the Son also that the Father establishes the conditions by means of which his purpose can be fulfilled. That is, through his death, God's elect, both Jew and Gentile, have redemption and forgiveness. Together, redemption and forgiveness create conditions of peace and so also of unity. I've got references for all these, but I'm not going to read them all out. Finally, those who are in Christ have been marked off as the Father's own children by the Spirit and by the same Spirit have been given a foretaste of or down payment upon the inheritance that will be theirs when God's purposes are fully realized. It is therefore not surprising that in 4.3 Paul uses a participial phrase that has the force of an imperative to appeal to his readers to, quote, strive earnestly to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And behind this appeal, behind it lies God's entire purpose for the world. And so it appears that God's good name and eternal purpose are bound up with the sort of life lived by the members of God's assembly. 
The life God intends is one of unity. And as we have seen, the author of this letter employs a wide range of imagery. Listen to this. Political, domestic, religious, fellow citizen, members of the household of God, the holy temple of the Lord. To emphasize the extraordinary and complete unity for which Jew and Gentile together in the Lord are to strive. To add strength to his appeal, he links these images to two additional ones that are even more comprehensive and more pointed. Christ's reconciling act is so that God might create in Christ a new humankind, a new Adam. This new humankind is so closely linked in Christ that it can be said to be one body. Now listen, a new humankind, one body, a commonwealth, fellow citizens, members of a single household, children of one God and Father, those who share one spirit and one inheritance, the temple of the Lord. The images of unity cascade one after another. And without forcing the evidence, one can say that according to Ephesians, from before the creation, God had a clear purpose to unite all things created in Christ Jesus. And the unity has its center in Christ and God's elected people who have been picked out before the creation of the world and marked off beforehand to live in a way that redounds to God's glory. Calvin understood that. The calling of the church, therefore, is to manifest in its common life the unity God purposes, and in this way, through the peace God has brought about by Christ's sacrifice, God's glory will be perceived and praised by the peoples of the earth. Then there will be one God and Father of all. Through this divinely wrought unity, the entire creation will be caught up in the blessing God desires to bestow and will render to God the praise that is rightly His. Now here I come to the central point I wish to make about the location of moral theology within ecclesiology. The author of Ephesians makes clear links between the fulfillment of the purpose of God, the perception of God's glory, and the common life of the church. And the link is this. The members of God's assembly have been chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before God in love. The grace bestowed in Christ tears down walls of hostility that separate the peoples of the earth and engenders love. And love, in turn, elicits praise. So the destiny of those who make up God's people is to live for God's glory. The idea seems to be that the love manifest in the sacrifice of Christ and imitated in the common life of the church shows forth God's grace and glory and so manifests God's majesty to the entire creation. It is then the sacrifice of Christ and the life of the church in love that draws all things to God and serves to restore the unity of creation. With Karl Barth, then, we can say that it accords, the, with, that it accords with Holy Scripture to say that what we call Christian ethics, or I prefer to call moral theology, is central to the identity of the church and as such serves as a form of witness on the part of the church to the purposes of God. Now, I can establish the same point by tracking what Ephesians has to say about the basis or foundation of the unity that is characteristic of life in Christ. And it's well to note at the outset that the basis of the unity to which Ephesians testifies is certainly quite different from that most commonly imagined and sought in the classical and Hellenistic worlds. For the unity of the world according to the Old and New Testament does not reside, as among the Ionian natural philosophers, in an original substance, nor with the Pythagoreans in an underlying harmony of parts, nor as with the Stoics in a universal structure of reason. 
Neither does the Bible conceive of the unity of creation as organic. The whole world is not compared to a body. Rather, the idea of unity encountered in the Bible is thoroughly political in that it is based in the rule of God. As Hansen con Zig Hansen contends, it is a question of God and God's will. The world being a unity means from a Jewish viewpoint everything in the world conforming to the will of the Creator. The personal relationship between God and the world, especially humankind, is thus characteristic of the Jewish idea of unity. The basis of the goal of Christian living is the rule of God. The, <clears throat> sorry. This rule has been established through the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. It has an origin, however, in God's choice of a people through whom he will bring his purposes to fruition. And this choice was made before the foundation of the world. As adopted children, God's people are to be obedient and so live a holy, blameless life in love. And in so doing, call forth the praise of God. Christ draws them into a holy and blameless life of love, but they are bound to Christ by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Through the Spirit, God's people participate in Christ's rule. They are seated with Him in the heavenly places, and through the Spirit, they are assured that they are full members of God's household. And further, through the Spirit, they are able to live their lives on a different basis namely love, and also take in the full dimension of God's purpose and God's glory, what the Episcopal calls the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of God's purpose for the world. In short, through the Spirit, Christ resides in the hearts of believers, and for this reason, their lives are based in God's love for them and in the love that God engenders in their lives. Now, I have provided a horribly condensed version of the Trinitarian basis of life in Christ as it is presented in this letter. It seems fair to say in summary, however, that the basis of the unity God purposes is the economy of God the Father, whose purpose is the unity of all things in Christ, of God the Son, who establishes the conditions for this unity through his sacrificial death, and his administration of God's plan, and God the Holy Spirit who incorporates believers into Christ and so makes available to them an understanding both of God's purposes and the reconciling benefits of his death and resurrection. It seems fair to say as well that the account of the character of Christian living that I am about to rehearse is unintelligible apart from the Trinitarian foundation it is provided by the author of this remarkable letter. In short, the way in which Christians are to live is an aspect of the nature and calling of the church, and the nature and calling of the church is tied directly to the person and work of Christ, and the person and work of Christ is tied directly to the counsel of God the Father and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the common life of the church. You can see why I don't want to stop Christian ethics at principles and justice. What then does a life worthy of the calling of God's people look like? If we ran into it, how would we see it? What is its character? By what stamp or mark is it to be identified? The answer Paul provides to this question places the form of Christian living firmly within his understanding of the nature and calling of the church. This is part of the book I like. <laughs> his presentation of the character of the life of the church follows a double reminder to his readers. They are to remember, that's a very important word, they are to remember first that once they were subject to rebellious forces that oppose God, and second, that once they were separated from Christ and cut off from the benefits they now enjoy. Remember, they've got to be told to remember this. They ain't perfect. 
This reminder is meant to alert his readers to the fact that through Christ, that though Christ has defeated the powers that once ruled over them, these very powers still fight on. This reality leads Paul, and I use the word, I beg you, he begs his readers to live a life that is worthy. And he goes on in chapters 4 through 6 to give a reasonably thick description of a life worthy of the calling of the church. And as I've argued, that calling is to be manifest in its common life. It is to manifest the unity that is God's purpose for his creation. It is, in short, my conviction that his account of a worthy life is descriptive of something you'll recognize from the prayer book of the good works God has prepared for us to walk in. Those are the ones. Paul's plea is for his readers to live a worthy life is uttered in light of the possibility that they may not live in a way that is oxios or worthy of the unity God purposes. In the first instance, however, a worthy life is a life that is holy and blameless in love. And by being holy and blameless before the Lord is the first heading under which Paul's discussion of, a char of character, of a worthy character, is presented. Paul wishes to show that love has a face. It is recognizable. A life that is holy and blameless before God in love is marked first by certain virtues, or I would prefer to call them graces. The first mentioned in Ephesians 4.2 are lowliness, meekness, the Greek word is typeponosune, it's too long for me to say, and praltis. Both words offer severe challenges to any would-be translator. By derivation, typeponosune, comes from two words, the first of which means of humble condition and the second, mind or intellect. The humility enjoined by Ephesians is thus of a certain kind. Both its derivation and the context in which it appears in the letter suggest that it refers to a particular form of humility, namely humility of mind. It is consequently a form of humility that opens one to instruction in ways that imitate Christ's attitude to his Father. In like manner, it is difficult to find the right word for praltes, which is generally translated meekness. The word can mean gentleness or a form of lowliness that is accompanied by reliance upon God to vindicate one's cause. The, la the latter meaning seems to predominate in Matthew where the, adjective, uh, the adjectival form praus is used to refer to those of low estate who wait faithfully upon the Lord. However, in the Pauline epistles, the word is often translated gentleness. And it's difficult to tell in the case of Ephesians which of the two is the better translation. However, the dominant usage in Paul's other letters is gentleness. And this use, along with the context of the use of Proutus in Ephesians 4.1, suggests gentleness as a more accurate, that, more, that it more accurately captures the meaning than humble openness. What I want to say is that the context is of particular importance. The passage, in the passage, Proutus appears between humility of mind and long-suffering patience, macrothumia, and proceeds two participial phrases with an imperative sense. In the Pauline letters, along with suffering patience is connected, the I, sorry, long-suffering patience is connected in particular with the long-suffering of God who, provo who provides space for repentance. In like manner, Christians are to show forbearance one with another. Consequently, in the participial phrases, they are urged to be forbearing, anakomenoi, with one another in love and to be eager to maintain unity in the bond of peace. The close connection between humility of mind, patience, and a demand to be forbearing in love and to have a desire to maintain unity 
all suggest that proutus here denotes gentleness in the treatment of others and in particular perhaps an erring brother or sister so that the unity and place and peace of the church can be maintained. Paul is building a thick description of a worthy life. It is spelled out in further detail in the admonition that appears at the end of the fourth chapter and at the beginning of the fifth. There believers are urged to be urged because they are members one of another to be kind and tender-hearted. These graces require that they forgive one another because they themselves have been forgiven. And this admonition is capped off with a command, namely, that in their common life, members of the church be imitators of God as beloved children should be, and so walk in a way that imitates that of the firstborn who, lived, who loved them and gave himself to death for them as a sacrifice to God. This list of worthy qualities is extensive and mirrors those exhibited in the life of Christ. And I'm going to just condense this paragraph. They're, un they're underscored by the fact that the, the phrase one another is used no less than five times in this passage. It's clear that the reference is one another, one another, one another. But at this point, it's wise to pause for a moment to take stock of what this description of a worthy life implies about the common life of the church and the place of these graces in that life. Does it imply, does it imply that the church is without remainder a community of communities in which no traces of a former life are to be found? Is the life of the church without spot or wrinkle? Is it one in which one finds no bitterness, wrath, anger, malice, contentious argument, or slander? Is it one in which no one is a child in the Lord, blown about by every bit of trendy teaching? Is it one where there are no children who need to grow up to the full stature of Christ? No, I don't think so. And I don't think Paul did. These graces are to be deployed in the midst of all the imperfections and struggles that make up the life of the church prior to the Lord's return. It is the development of these graces in the faces of in the face of the forces that oppose sorry, it is the deployment of these graces in the face of the forces that oppose God within the church and without that brings to light the character that is worthy of the calling and with, to which the saints have been called. In their deployment, the world can see lives that are holy and blameless before Christ in love. These graces are what I like to call love's little helpers, the graces that give love a face and whose presence suggests love's perfection. Being filled with the Spirit is part of all this, and the letter suggests it's also connected with giving thanks for everything in the name of the Lord and being subject one to another out of reverence for Christ. We can now add a fourth mark to the character of life in Christ, paying attention to how one goes through life. I've skipped a bit, but he, he talks about this in, in walking as wise. Living a wise rather than a foolish life, giving thanks for everything and being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's clear from the text that paying attention, living as wise, giving thanks and being subject one to another are imperatives directed to all the saints without regard to gender or social status. These graces join the ranks of the ones set forth in chapter 4, paying attention Living, in, living as wise rather than foolish and giving thanks are practices that are in no way problematic to the modern reader. Now, he, here we come to a methodological issue. The command to be subject one to another because of its connection with subject, subjection within the household is both problematic and offensive to readers in societies whose life is in part the product of the Enlightenment. 
For example, does the household code found in Ephesians 5, 21 through 6, 9 actually subvert the more egalitarian description of Christ's administration of the last age found in Ephesians 2, 3 through 18? These are questions that just can't be ignored. At the outset, it's important to make some determination about the significance of the very size of this section of the letter. It has been argued that its length suggests that it contains the letter's central point, namely that both the peace of the household and the peace of the church depend upon respect for hierarchical order. Here's the attempt to posit a, a specific issue behind the text. A more likely explanation, in my view, of the length of the passage can be found elsewhere in the sociological reasons located, sorry, there are sociological reasons located in the Greco-Roman account of life as a polity, of the, life, of the life of a polity. These require, in addition to proposals about the public life of the polis, a discussion of the ethics of the household. To the Hellenistic mind, the household constitutes the basic basic building block of society. And thus, if the author of Ephesians was to give an account of the larger unit, the commonwealth of the church, that made sense to people to whom he wrote, he would also have to give an account of what the constituent of units, namely the household. You talk about the public space, you have to talk about the private space. That's the rule of thought. These were the rules of social, moral, and political thought laid down by Plato and Aristotle, and these rules continue to hold sway in the Hellenistic period. So for sociological reasons, an account of the common life of the church required discussion of domestic relations. There were also theological reasons that made such a discussion necessary. As Francis Rotson has written, if within the one body the relationship between a husband and wife is impaired, that is a threat to the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace that binds together the whole body. Within the body there are no purely private concerns, for we are members one of another. If, Christ, if God's chief business is indeed the unity of all things in Christ, the way in which that unity is to be expressed and worked out in the household becomes a matter of primary importance. If the church is to fulfill its calling, it can do so only if its basic units manifest the peace and unity in Christ, in Christ, sorry, unity in Christ of God's assembly. That can't be set aside. It has to be manifest. Well, I'm looking at my watch, and I have more to say, but I don't think there's really time to do that. I hope that, um, I hope I've been able to make the point that you can't really understand the ethical teaching of Ephesians apart from its theological foundation and the basic goal of the church. And if I had world enough and time, I think I could show that the possible exceptions to this that one might point to the prophets, for example, is it not the, the, so, the reform of an unjust society? Uh, St. Luke, is it not uh, a ministry to the poor? Revelation, is it not a stance against a demonic government? Or Matthew, is it not, in fact, the life of the soul that becomes the primary focus? And I think I could show that in each case, the real issue is the integrity of God's people and how they live with one another and the witness they make to the world.